Hello everyone and I'm back again to tell you a little bit about containerization of software and in particular want to provide something for people who are completely new to the idea of software containers, what they're for, are they really any good and to be able to answer the question hopefully by the end of the short video series is is containerization a great idea or is it just the latest fad that everyone is talking about and something that's going to go away within a few years so i've created this series partly because I find that there aren't many necessarily good presentations, uh, very good videos around, but also the ones that are good tend to be presented by people who are experts and therefore they sometimes maybe rush into concepts that they have forgotten that they had to learn in the first place. So I want to really kind of start with the basics build you into that and over the next series of uh, four videos I think it is to hopefully give you an idea of, of how these containers work what all the hype is about and whether it's something that you should be using on one of your own projects so just a little bit about me that's my name Luke Briner and I'm currently the development manager at Smart Survey and I'm based in the UK I've got probably nearly 20 years experience, started in C and C++ and spent most of my more recent industry experience with C Sharp and, and the .NET kind of framework really, .NET Core included. And I've also used Windows, Linux and Mac OS in my life at different points in time, so I'm familiar across kind of operating systems. Also have a reasonable amount of cloud experience and that's both infrastructure and platform as a service and I've also dabbled in a couple of other languages that I wouldn't consider myself an expert in but I have done PHP, Java, Enterprise Edition, Android, even iOS at one point so I've kind of touched a lot of different things really as a developer so I'm coming at this really as a developer although someone who now has a lot more responsibility with deployments and builds and DevOps and things like that. But importantly, I'm new to containers. I've been maybe spending the last three or four months playing around, learning concepts, working at how it all fits together. And so really these videos hopefully will be simple enough for people who are new to the topic to understand. But as I say, I am new to it. So there might be some subtle little detail that I get wrong. And I apologize for that if that happens, but I don't think it's going to be a problem. So containers uh, kind of introduction really is we're talking about something that's a very hot topic in the development world. And if you are a developer, a professional developer, and you haven't been hearing about things like Docker and Kubernetes, then I would definitely ask you where you've been because people are talking about them all the time. That doesn't mean that every company in the world is using them for sure. And it doesn't mean that your company uses them now and might not even be able to use them in the future for reasons that we'll look at later. But it's definitely a very hot topic. And although this series is going to be looking really at Docker and Kubernetes, that is for one reason, because they are by far the most popular containerized um, uh, container runtime in terms of Docker and Kubernetes as an orchestrator of containers. But I must say right now there are others that are available. Some people would say you definitely should not use Docker, you should use one of the alternatives, or you should definitely not use Kubernetes, you should use something else. I'll leave that as an exercise to you guys, because most of what we're talking about here applies to Docker, Kubernetes, and all of the other orchestrators and runtimes that are available as well. The second reason is that Docker and Kubernetes are the two that I've been working with purely because they're the most popular. It's been easier to, to get information about them, how they work, and to learn them myself. So containers also very much integrated with DevOps. If you've not heard of DevOps, again, that's um, I might do a video on that. But DevOps in its simplest form is the idea of getting things out the door as quickly as possible in, in a good way, in a controlled way. So imagine the difference between two companies that are competing and the first company uh, gets a, a request feature and it takes them six months to get that feature out of the door. They could have lost a lot of sales 
in six months because that's a, a long time in today's market for something to actually get implemented. And imagine that the problem wasn't the amount of code work that was required, but really the number of barriers between development work taking place and something going live into production. So compare that with a different company who has a DevOps philosophy, who has removed a lot of these barriers, at least the, the manual barriers, the sign offs and the long system testing sections of, of the pipeline. And then maybe they could get something through the pipeline in, in one week, for example. Clearly, that's a, a lot better in terms of market perception, agility, and also, to be fair, not keeping, not holding on to features that actually become unrequired over the period of time it's taking you to deploy it. And that happens quite frequently. In fact, somebody asks for something, we spend six months implementing it, and by the time it goes live, the customer doesn't want it anymore. And of course, they probably haven't paid for it either. Whereas if we've got the ability to go live quickly, we can say to them, well, if you sign off on this, we'll get it in into production in a week and you can start paying us for it. If they don't want it within six months, well, that's fine because they've already paid for it. So DevOps is all about moving things quickly and learning from our mistakes and keeping the quality high while we also increase the throughput. So containers work really well with that. Again, we'll look at more details of how that works later. But I would say for a developer, particularly for anyone into builds, into operations, you really need to know what containers are. You need to know the problems they solve and how they solve them, because there are probably a lot of projects that you work on that would really benefit from using containers. But that said, the other part of this is I can say up front and I can say this with hand on heart, containers are not a good fit for everything. They do bring in additional complexity, additional education, different ways of thinking about things. There are extra pieces of work required, so they're not going to suit every company. But as with all good development professionals, by understanding what is being offered with these different technologies, you can make an educated decision whether you want to go with containers or not. And of course, you can mix and match containers with non-containerized architectures as well. So you could have one application using containers and a different application not using them. So of course, you can mix and match. So I am going to do four videos. The first video, this one is really just an introduction, a high level view of containerization, what the motivation is for it and what a container basically looks like or, or how a, a container is defined. And then I'm going to do three additional videos looking more specifically about how this changes the way a developer works, how this changes the way that a de DevOps or a build professional does their job and also what deployment and operations look like. The videos won't all be the same length because uh, containers are very much a deployment tool and they affect deployments probably you know five times as much at least as they affect developers and build. So the last video will probably take the longest but for each of those additional videos I'll be putting in some more specific examples and showing you what these things actually look like when you're doing them. But this first video we're really just going to keep this nice and high level and hopefully by the end of it you're kind of going to get a bit of a feel for whether this is something you want to do some more study on. So the motivation, let's think about two examples here. The first example is the classic example used on the Docker website of a container ship. Now, it, just ask yourself quickly, why do we put things in containers? And probably the answer will be quite obvious to you. And you go, well, of course, it's about standardization. But then let's also think about the 19 inch rack mounted. In this case, it's a PC. But there are lots of other pieces of equipment that are built to fit a 19 inch rack unit. And again, it's about standardization. But here we've got two slightly different scenarios. The shipping container on the ship is very much about the movement of something from A to B. Whereas the rack unit is very much about its final destination where something is going to be installed. And in the same way that the standardization of shipping containers and equipment racks helps the movement and the installation of 
whatever it is in this case in the containers in the case of software we're talking about making it easier to move software through a pipeline and also making it easier to deploy that software into its final installed location so the shipping container we're talking about things that are easy to move so if you think about the the ship there that's got all of these 40 foot containers stacked up on it they are efficiently stacked and stored so for a ship, that's obviously important. They'll fit together nicely. There aren't lots of gaps everywhere. So you're getting a kind of a, a lot of a, a good resource utilization for your large ships that are going around the world. Another thing about the shipping container, of course, is it's well supported in industry because it is not just a standard. Really, it's the standard for shipping. And although they do have a couple of different sizes, as I learned the other day, if you want to transport something anywhere in the world, if you put it into a shipping container, you're almost guaranteed that 90% of everybody you call, whether it's a truck driver, a train driver, a shipping company, whatever it is, they are all going to be able to support that shipping container. So you immediately open up your market by using a standard container or, or open up your supply chain by uh, using a standard container. Now, it's kind of obvious all of these things but just imagine for a second what it would be like if you were shipping something like a grand piano that was not in a container so just imagine that you're calling up these people let's say a truck driver or a, a shipping company and you're saying look I've got a grand piano and most of them are going to say we can't move a grand piano we just don't have the facilities uh, we, we can't protect it well enough you know if you can't put it in a shipping container we can't move it but maybe you would find one truck driver who says oh, I can move the piano but then they take it to a train yard and the guys in the train yard said, well, we can't move a grand piano. Trains aren't designed to move grand pianos. Not anymore. Anyway, they're designed for containers. So at every stage, you would really struggle to move that that grand piano. But yet, when we look at software, most of us are still trying to ship grand pianos, bespoke items that are all very different and wondering why we're struggling. So that's the kind of the movement part of it but the 19 inch rack then is really about where something is installed its final uh, i was gonna say resting place but that's a little bit different the final installation location so the the thing here really the trick is all of these different items can go into the same place so these items in this rack i mean it looks like a um a, a kind of a networking rack it's got some the network switches in there it's got a patch bay at the top looks like it's got some kind of um, digital video recorder maybe at the bottom and a couple of um, fiber interfaces by the looks of it at the bottom all of those units serve very different purposes and yet they all fit into the same rack and thinking about that in terms of software imagine the deployment of your database your web services your web applications your worker nodes your internal reporting at the moment again most of us are building bespoke deployment locations for these things because they are different and they've served different purposes but really if we could standardize those deployments into some kind of container then we could fit them all into a single deployment unit so all of a sudden we can potentially have a single cluster a single deployment location whether it's on premises in the cloud or anywhere else where we can just chuck all of these different things in there wire them up just like we do in the rack and not need to have all of these different configurations so we've kind of covered this a little bit but let's look at some of the issues that containers are there to solve now most of these are not the main reason that containers were invented they were definitely invented mainly to help with deployment and that that idea of the 19 inch rack where we put everything in the same rack and it just all kind of works but a lot of these are kind of second hand benefits that we get by using containers at different stages and these are going to be the things i'm going to cover in the subsequent videos in development in build in operations to actually look at in what way do these things actually do this but for development there are a couple of benefits of using containers not enough benefits 
to use containers just for this reason, just for development. But they are things that we can't ignore as benefits. One of them is to do with the setting up of developer machines, which if any of you have ever done that, it's very slow, very difficult. Um, and it, as with most of these, there are ways to do this already. But the ways to do it already tend to involve a lot of automation, a lot of configuration, and often somebody whose job whose job is just to keep those automation tools up to date. So it's not like these things happen automatically, but containers can help us with setting that up. Um, things like the tweaks that we have to make. So when somebody downloads your code for the first time, they try and run it and then you go, oh, that's not running. What's going on? You think, ah, I remember I needed to set up IIS or install IIS, set up IIS Express, add that config file, put that file in that location in the folder to make it work. So you end up doing all of these tweaks, which not only you've forgotten about, but in many cases, they're not automated in any way. You just have to remember that when somebody new comes along, they're going to have to do that as well. And sometimes that can take a number of days before that develop developer, that new developer can confidently take your code uh, and get up and running. Obviously, that depends on the type of code you're using. That might not be a problem for you, but it definitely is for some people. And the other classic that uh, containers very much seek to help out with is this problem that it worked when I ran it locally, but when it went into production, it failed. Something failed. It crashed. It didn't return the right data. It's, you know, it's maybe not working all the time properly, but whenever I run it locally, it's fine. And that is a... Uh, a classic configuration problem. Obviously, what that means is there is something on your local machine that is different than it is on the deployment machine. And because of the way at the moment we have so much flexibility with how the, we set these things up, without containers, we could have hundreds of pieces of configuration that are different between our local machine and the production machine. And some of those might be deliberate. So we might have a different... Um, TLS or HTTPS configuration and production for some reason. We probably are pointing to local or development versions of databases. So that's a, a, something that's deliberately different between local and production. But whatever those things are and whether those are there for good reason, we want to try and avoid this problem where, yeah, well, it worked locally and now it doesn't work in production. And if I download it, it still works locally, it still doesn't work in production. And then we can end up wasting a lot of time. And in terms of the shipping, so we're talking here about our build pipeline. And for some of us, that might mean simply we build the code or in the case of containers, we build the container image but it could mean unit tests, it could mean performance tests, it could mean user acceptance tests, it could mean a whole number of different parts of that pipeline that take place either before your product gets to production or maybe in parallel with production. So we could be talking about something fairly significant and we have the same kind of problems about really about configuration and recreating the configuration. We're dealing with different operating systems, different build tools, different versions of build tools or libraries. So we've had problems with, say, the Visual Studio build tools because some of the database project build tools haven't been updated in the most recent versions. So you install a later version of the .NET SDK and it doesn't include the database build tools. So then you have to go back and in, you know um, install those build tools as part of an older installation just so that they're available. You've got people like uh, Microsoft and others, although I have most experience in Microsoft, and they changed the locations of folders. So things that worked in version 2007 don't work in 2011 anymore because things got moved and it's broken build agents. It's broken our customized scripts that we spent, you know, hours and hours putting together. So you've got all of that shenanigans. That's just about the, the build process. But even the installation methods, if you're going to be installing things to test them, you've got, you know, installers that are executable type installers. You might have a folder and everything just gets copied as a folder. You might have a web deploy, like a, a kind of Microsofty thing where you, you publish, you run some kind of command to publish it. And these things, they always sound simple, but very often 
particularly with things like web deploy, which thank goodness they don't use quite so much anymore, is you're, you're opening up specific ports, you're setting up permissions, you're setting up permission delegation in IIS. You've got all of these things. The error messages are not always very obvious. And you have to repeat that for every single environment that you're building that you want to deploy to. And then there's the, the generation storage of these different deployment sources. You might be using a NuGet package to deploy, a zip file, some kind of make-based um, configuration that needs to be run on the target server to install. So all of those, those kind of complexities are there because at the moment we're building everything to be bespoke. And most of the automation tools, just to repeat it, that they can provide a way of helping with this to reproduce it, but they don't really take away the work that's required in the first place to build all of these scripts and to keep them up to date. Like I say, you write a script and it works great, and then you run it on the next version of Windows Server and it doesn't work anymore because a permission changed or because something got moved or whatever. So we, we mustn't underestimate the amount of technical debt that automation tools can produce if we're not careful. We then get the issue of scaling the build pipelines. If I want to add more build agents to my build process or new environments. So let's say I've decided to add a, a penetration testing environment for the security team. Well, again, for most of us, that is a really quite a difficult process. We love the idea that we click a button and copy and paste the whole environment. But for most of us, that simply does not happen. We need to manually provision hardware, even if it's in the cloud. We have to install a ton of stuff, configure a ton of stuff, install a ton of stuff, run it up, fix it, run it up, fix it, run it up, fix it, and eventually hope for the best. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff here that um, hopefully you guys are, are kind of resonating and then a new stack creates blocking technical debt. So imagine somebody goes, oh, we've just realized that using, I don't know, Haskell for programming this new module of, I don't know, you know, statistics or something is a really great idea. But all of a sudden you're now creating work for the build team to actually have to go and work out what we need to install on all of the build agents or some of the build agents, how to get that process wired up. Does your, you know, your Jenkins or your Team City or your Bamboo or whatever, do they support Haskell out of the box or do I have to start writing and scripting my own build steps? So all of these things that we kind of think should be automatic because we're not doing anything that should be difficult but the reality is at the moment without containerization and some of the automation it can bring we're doing a lot of this manually and it can be a pain in the neck of course for some of us maybe we say well i don't face any of these problems but maybe you face a different problem and the problem that you have is you don't have the freedom to choose a different stack a newer technology a more cloud-friendly technology because you know that if you do try and bring that in, that you will start seeing all of these problems. So just because you're not facing them doesn't mean they're not there. It might just be that you're avoiding the problem in the first place. And that might be fine. But at some point, you might decide that you, you urgently need to do something. So getting some of these things in place early on in your company's life cycle, you know, can help. But as we say, when we look at more detail, you'll have to decide for yourself uh, what you know whether for your particular instance these are, these are things worth doing or not and then we have similar kind of problems with the actual deployment operation so let's say it's gone through our pipeline it's ready to go but at some point someone's going to flick the switch it's going to be copied into production somehow and then we're going to have to run it in operations so that means monitoring and and those sorts of things so hardware provisioning can be a pain again can be automated that automation isn't necessarily easy we tend to have to do a lot of configuration on these runtime machines again can be automated again not always easy and depending on how much scaling you do you might say well i don't do a lot of that anyway because we've got four web servers and we've had four web servers forever but what about you know windows updates what about different os versions what about when microsoft turn around and say oh we're not supporting you know server 2016 anymore and you go oh we we'll need to install server 2019 how are you going to do that on a running system this is a production system you can't just switch it off so what do you do you have to create more hardware you have to do all the configuration hopefully it's going to be the same you have to install everything you have to run it you have to test it you have to do a ton of stuff before you then bring that system up and turn off the other system so 
you've got all, all kinds of problems just with the provisioning. You've got different runtime versions. So PHP, .NET and the Java runtime environment, they've all got runtime versions. Some are compatible, some are not. So if you might have 10 different PHP web services, but maybe you want to move from PHP 6 to PHP 7, but PHP 7 has breaking changes in it. So all of a sudden you you have to ask, well, can these things run some run side by side? And the answer might be yes, the answer might be no. So the answer might be, well, to do that, we need a second PHP server running version 7 and we'll start putting the new ones onto that, taking them off of the old server and eventually migrate over. Things we maybe say, well, isn't that just real life operations? It's like, well, it kind of is, but actually containers can solve a lot of these problems for us without the, the manual steps and the configuration required to do it in the old fashioned way. So we have that. The actual deployment processes, again, we think they should be easy because surely deploying a .NET application is the same, however, you know, wherever you are in the world. But again, the truth is that's not quite right. We've got different places we're deploying it to. If we're deploying .NET Core to Linux instead of Windows, that's going to be different. If we've got uh, an old .NET Framework app needs web deploy, but .NET Core can use the .NET command line. So all of these different things come into play. We have all the same problems of installation of host software. We need our web server, DB engine monitoring. We might have caching platforms. We might have all kinds of stuff that we install in order just to get the thing up and running in the first place. So again, the automation of that is, you know, can be pretty tricky as well. And the configuration of them, again, we install IIS or Nginx or Apache or whatever. We install our app and we go, great, it looks like it's working. And then a week later, somebody goes, oh, every now and then somebody gets an error on this page. And then we realize that we forgot to switch a certain feature on or, or whatever. So in some ways, we'd rather have obvious errors, wouldn't we, when we first deploy new servers. But very often we, we don't get that. And then these application performance monitoring systems you can get, things like New Relic and Dynatrace, all the rest of it. Again, they can be cool, but the ones that work well across all platforms, which are not many of them, tend to be quite expensive. And we kind of think, well, I don't necessarily really want to do that. I'd rather just have a, a kind of a built-in monitoring tool, especially if we're just monitoring the basics. If you're a small company, you don't want to be paying 20, 30, 40,000 plus a year just to have a, one application to monitor your live production systems. So that can be a challenge as well. Scaling for some of us who need to scale out um, on short notice often. So all the best will in the world. We know when we're about to sell tickets for, a, as you say, a Coldplay concert, but I don't think they're playing anymore. You know, tickets for U2 or something. We know that as soon as that, that sale goes live, we're going to have, you know, 5 million people on the site at the same time. Well, then we can generally cope with that. We can tell our cloud provider in advance to spin up another thousand servers or however many we need. Um, we kind of just then have to deal with it. But of course, a lot of the time we don't get that notice that the site's about to get very busy. It might take a news article and all of a sudden everyone's going, oh, I wonder who this company are. And then they all start searching for you and they land on your site. And all of a sudden you get a massive spike in users. And with traditional deployment uh, methods, the scaling can be really slow or you might have a little bit of capacity so you might say, well, we run our, our servers at 50% resource. Great. Well, you can handle another, you know, couple of thousand people, but any more than that. And some of us cannot scale out at all without physically creating a new server. So that's not going to happen anytime soon. Even the automated ones using Ansible and things like that to deploy new servers can take, you know, a good 20, 30, 40 you know, minutes plus, depending on what the platform is and, and what the OS is. Whereas even things like, say, Azure App Services is actually it's containers underneath. But, you know, to, to all intents and purposes, it seems like something that's designed to give you scale. But then you realize that, well, you can only scale out so far. You can only have on the, the premium layer something like 50 instances of your web server, which is quite a few but it's not loads and if each of those instances is only say two cores and four or eight gig of ram they're not particularly meaty instances if you want more than that you have to run up another app service host 
and then load balance across them. So again, that's not a, a 20 second operation that could take again, 10, 20 minutes plus per environment and all of then the hassle of, of the DNS changes and everything else. So um, the scaling can be really, really hard, not relevant to everybody, but um, but relevant to some of us. And I guess the bottom line for all of this really is this statement that recreating an environment is hard and it shouldn't be. If I have a production environment, theoretically, or certainly in my imagination, if I want a second production environment that's the same, I should kind of be able to copy and paste it because I want all the same machines configured all the same way, etc., etc. And although some automation tools kind of promise that, the reality is none of them do it automatically because there are a lot of things that we can change in an operating system that an automated tool is simply not going to be able to see. We can use things like VM snapshots and stuff, which we'll look at later on, but they, they bring with them their own challenges. So there's a really quite a list of, of, of challenges, really, problems that some of us face more than others. But let's briefly look at some of the current solutions because you could say, yeah, that's that's all true, Luke, but we've we've got stuff, we've got tooling to handle all of these things. So first of all, you could talk about things like automation tooling. So you might have heard of Ansible, of Terraform, Azure Resource Manager, uh, a number of others there, you know, Puppet and your chef and all the rest of it. They tend to work at slightly different levels. So some of them really are concerned about application and configuration. Others are concerned about hardware and provisioning hardware and getting the hardware set up ready for the software. Some of them cross that line and do both. But again, like I said before, they can do a lot of the work in a, in a relatively easy way, but you still have to maintain them. You still have to do a lot of work yourself because Ansible can't tell you how to configure HTTPS. That's a decision for architecture. And it's something that you would have to decide and you would have to tell it, even if it had a little task in there to set the HTTPS configuration for Windows, for example. So there is uh, an amount of work there and a lot of people have maybe moved away from one sort of hassle into a different sort of hassle. And that's always the danger is we go, oh, I hate doing all these things manually. So you create a load of automation tooling and you still end up doing a lot of stuff manually. You just do it in the tooling rather than on the OS. So they don't necessarily help a great deal, but it depends on your use case. VM snapshots, uh, snapshots, as I mentioned before, are obviously a way of getting something that truly does capture the everything that's configured on a particular operating system. But there are problems with VM snap, snapshots. For a start, they imply that you're using an entire virtual machine for your host. And if you're trying to scale out to hundreds or thousands of web servers, you don't really want one virtual machine per web server because that's very wasteful of resources and very expensive. Whereas when you use containers, which we'll look at later when we look at the details, you get a much smaller unit of work, which means it scales out much more easily and costs, costs you far less. So you've got a bit of a resource issue with VM snapshots. The other thing is, is it's very difficult to keep them up to date. So if you have a snapshot that's six months old, and I've done this before, I run it up as, a, let's say, an additional build agent based on a snapshot from the original build agent. And the first thing that happens is Windows wants to install six months worth of updates and all these other things have changed and everything else. So all of a sudden you're not actually restoring the same thing. You're potentially restoring something that's in a different state than the thing you've copied it from. So there are there are still problems with VM snapshots. They can take up a lot of space. And a snapshot as opposed to a backup is actually uh, effectively an incremental view of a virtual machine disk. So snapshots are not quite as solid as they might sound like. Although they do give us, in, in some cases, the easiest way to get something that's very close to what we want. So um, at the cost of, of that efficiency. And then the other thing some of us do, we harmonize software, heavily harmonize it. If we keep our stack the same, if we only ever use .NET, we only ever use Ruby, we only ever use Python, whatever it might be, then obviously that makes our life easier but it doesn't solve the problems. It just kind of reduces the amount of them. And again, it might prevent us from using something that would actually work much better for us as a company because we don't want to dilute 
our stack with a new technology that needs new builds and new servers and new hosts and new whatever else. So um, that can be, again, a mixed blessing. The frequent updating, uh, again, I've kind of put this in as a current solution, but it, it's really kind of saying, well, this is how we keep keep things working is we just have to automate the updates all the time, make sure everything's always updated. So maybe everything always runs on PHP 7. At a certain point, we're going to decide to do that. Everything gets migrated and then we're always on PHP 7. So we never get the problem of, say, runtime version problems. But again, we, we say that like it's an easy thing. And in most cases, it's not easy. We have an old product. It relies on old features of PHP. We don't really want to spend the time migrating it. Maybe it's a, a product that's hardly used. Maybe it has one or two customers. Yeah, they're paying some money. We're not going to delete it. But actually, they don't pay enough money for us to spend six weeks trying to migrate it all uh, or rewrite it or whatever. So it's not always a, a possibility anyway. So trying to do that, it works great when you're a small company. It's doable when you're a small company. As soon as you have more than about three or four products, that will start to become um, uh, not not a viable solution. And the other thing, as I mentioned before, things like um, Azure App Services, there are others. You get management solutions which can hide a lot of these details. So, for example, with Azure App Services, you can deploy a .NET web app directly onto a platform, directly onto a, uh, a system in the cloud. And then a certain number of parts of maintenance become Microsoft's problem and not yours. So you don't have to do Windows updates. That's hidden from you. You don't have to, you know, manage broken disks and, and all the rest of it. Is a lot of those things are taken care of. And then you get to just worry about your application and not have to worry about other things. So, in yeah, it can provide some parts of the solution for sure. But there's obviously the danger of that lock in. If I use Azure App Services, I'm kind of telling myself I can't then decide to put the database on Amazon because they're going to be two different cloud providers, however many miles apart. So if I go with Azure App Services, I can't kind of need to put everything else in Azure. So that might be a problem. There might be a cost issue there. There might be a vendor lock in kind of issue. So some of these things are great and they, you know, they certainly help us. But as with all things, they come at a cost. And we need to decide. But I would suggest that even with all of these things added together, we, we're still ending up with a significant amount of complexity and we're not really solving all of the problems in the best way. And I think, again, to say, just to be honest up front, that containerization can solve a lot of these issues in a very straightforward way, which is why we should learn a bit about it. So at a very top level then, we've only got a couple more slides left. Let's just kind of ask what what actually is a container? Okay, you've you've sold me on the idea that they might be useful. What what does it actually look like if I'm writing software? Well, really this is the top line. This is as, as simple as I could kind of make the, the description. A container is really an entire deployment with the minimal runtime required to make the app work. So we're saying if my application needs PHP, that is included inside the container. But there are a lot of other things that would be present on a virtual machine or on a bare metal server that would not be in the container because they're not directly needed. So let's say an antivirus program, the server needs antivirus, my application doesn't need antivirus, or let's say in most cases an application doesn't need antivirus. So the antivirus isn't in the container. I've pretty much got um, my application and an amount of runtime. And depending on the, the minimal runtime I can have, if this was a Windows container, there might be a lot of Windows runtime. But then at the same time, if I'm running .NET Core on Linux, then these containers are very small. So they could be, you know, 50 or 100 meg in size compared to the size of a VM, which could easily be 30 plus gig. So even just size wise, minimal kind of deployment, all encapsulated in a little box. It runs inside a container environment. So the container runtime, so Docker itself, which builds containers, can also run containers. But Docker is not designed as a kind of a production ready system. It doesn't really support all of the complex networking and kind of runtime monitoring and things that a production grade system would. But it is useful for testing because you can run up a container locally and make sure it behaves in the right way. However, there are others, the orchestrators, which we'll talk about later. Docker Swarm is Docker's offering. Kubernetes, 
um, Nomad. There are a number of different systems that all have different pros and cons. That is the container environment and this little box that we've built with our application, our runtime runs inside this environment. Now, the definition is like, well, how do I make my code work in this container? In the case of Docker, we're literally talking about a single text file that lives in the project. And that text file, we'll look at an example in a second. That text file literally just says, this is how this project gets packaged up for a container. And that's all you have to do. The rest of the project is identical. There, there are some things we'll look at when we're talking about development that we'll need to avoid because we're not going to have access directly to operating system primitives. We can't just jump outside of our application and call things in the way that we might already be doing. But apart from those restrictions, the fact it's running in an isolated environment, the Docker file is all we need to turn something into a containerizable application. So, for example, a PHP application might just have the PHP runtime and nothing else or the PHP runtime and the application and nothing else. Because as long as the PHP runtime can access what it needs to, which might be some um, file I.O., might be some network I.O., but otherwise, as long as that's available to it, then that's all it needs. And then the application, all the application needs is access to the runtime and then maybe access again to files and networking. Anything like that, which is outside of that container, is only available if the container environment provides it. And of course, in most cases, container environments will provide the network infrastructure in order for um, applications to access other internal applications or to access the internet. And it will also provide some kind of file system access. So that could be local file storage, which is temporary, which gets deleted if the container dies. It might be a shared volume that's mounted from a number of different places. Again, we'll look at details of that later. But anything that's not packaged up is only available if the container environment provides it. So think of it a bit like a virtual machine on a diet because a lot of that stuff, there's no host operating system that's visible to the container. You don't have any of the things that the server needs within the container, just the runtime, the application, and everything else provided by the environment is external to that. So as an, a really simple example, here's one I grabbed off the internet. So this is a PHP application. So PHP applications don't get built or compiled. They just get... Um, translate, uh, what do you call it, interpreted by the web server on the fly. So we have this top line here, so this from. So this is the base image that we're building our container from. And there are tons of these that are around on public repositories. Microsoft do Microsoft ones. Docker Hub's got tons of them. So everything that you would ever need really is available as a base image. And in this case, you can see that this is a base image that is based on PHP version 718 and with Apache web server built in. Now, we wouldn't usually do this in production. We wouldn't usually package the web server and the application, but it doesn't really matter for the example of this Docker file. That is our base image. So everything that we're going to deploy has to be able to find everything that it needs in this image. What do we then do? Well, there is a space here. You can't quite see it, but it says copy everything inside the current directory. So that's the directory that's got all your, your code files in into the slash serve slash app directory in this image. How do I know what directories are there? It depends who built the image. So they tend to be some kind of conventions, but you certainly can't assume all of these you need to find out what um what locations are mapped by default but in this case it's saying copy all of my code into service app on that image or on a copy of that image it's obviously not changing the real image and then copy a vhost.conf from my docker directory into on this image etc apache 2 sites available blah 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 so the standard place for an apache config file and once it's copied those, it then just runs a, an ownership change to make sure that the Apache user, which is called www data, can access my code files where I've copied them to. So that's it. That's all it takes. When you run Docker build against this project, it will see this Docker file. If it needs to download this image, it will download it. If it's already downloaded, it doesn't need to download it again. 
it will do what it needs to do it will build up the container and this this step here is what happens um uh, sorry all of these steps happen when we run docker build but it is possible to run other steps that happen when you actually call docker run so that you say well when i actually get mounted then i might need to do some extra stuff but by and large this is it base image do a bit of stuff maybe copy some files and then in this case it's changing the permission so that apache can access it like i say if you didn't have apache installed and this was just a php service that line wouldn't be there that line wouldn't be there and that would probably be from php 7 copy that done two lines dead easy slightly more complicated example .NET core now this is one based on a windows base image so notice here this is a public repo so this is microsoft's microsoft container registry they have a whole load of dotnet core images with different versions of dotnet core and they also have ones based on uh, different versions of windows server and also excitingly different versions of linux so i think they support centos red hat and um and ubuntu base images for dotnet core only not for dotnet framework so this is a slightly different um, technique because a .NET project has to be compiled or in this case published before it's usable. So I can't just copy the files in and then just press go. What happens here is we start with an SDK image. Notice that has SDK in the path. This is .NET Core 2.2 with the SDK installed. Why do I do that? Well, first of all, I'm going to set my working directory so I don't have to add this to every single line that i do below first of all i copy in my project file and run dotnet restore now dotnet restore is available because the sdk is installed so this is going to install all my new get packages for my project and notice here i haven't even copied my code files yet just on the project and run dotnet restore by separating this into stages docker can very cleverly work out whether anything has changed if i would have done this part after copying all the files then every single time i run the docker build it's going to run dotnet restore which might be a waste of time the clever thing here is docker's going to go oh i noticed that of the files you copied last time you ran docker build this one hasn't changed so i don't need to run this anymore the previous layer that i built after running dotnet restore is still available and still valid so you get this super duper incremental build process then I'm copying all of my files, my C-sharp files, into the current directory, which is app, because that's what it says my work directory. And then I'm going to run .NET Publish, which does two things. It builds the application first, and then, because this is .NET Core, it has to publish it into a format that's going to run on the web server. So I set the configuration to release, and I specify the out output directory. So that is now pushing it into slash app slash out on the base image and then something else you see quite a lot which again is really important i've now got a different image for the runtime so notice it's still dotnet core but instead of sdk 2.2 it's now aspnet 2.2 so this is going to be a much smaller image it still might be a few hundred meg depending on in this case it's a windows server image so it's very likely to be a few hundred meg but this one's still going to be smaller than the sdk and of course, the cool thing is, is if there is a problem and I was using the SDK, the problem might be caused by the SDK being present and changing something. But here, because I'm not including the SDK in the final runtime, not only is it smaller, I'm removing the chance that something in the SDK is going to affect my final build. And then what do I do? Well, I set the work directory again to be apps, just so I don't have to keep writing app in my all of my commands. And then here... Notice what it's done is it's copying from a previous environment. So notice this had an alias up here. I'm copying from that step the contents of app out, which is remember is where we publish to. And then once that's copied into my app directory, I'm then telling it because this is .NET Core, I'm telling .NET where the entry point DLL is for this application. Uh, and that would generally be the name of your project. That's why it's injected here. It's not always called the same thing. So it just gets added to the Docker file here. So again, not massively complicated, very easy to understand. And once these things are built, 
you're not generally ever going to have to change this Docker file, even in .NET Core. It's it kind of does its stuff. And in Visual Studio specifically, when you create a new .NET Core project or a new .NET Framework um, one, in fact, it will say to you, "Do you want to include Docker support?" And if you do that, it will give you a Docker file with all of the names injected that you gave it, and then it will just work. So that's all it takes to make something into a container. But in the next video, we're going to be looking at what this looks like specifically from a developer's point of view. So we'll look at maybe creating a new pretend developer laptop using like a Linux VM or something. And then look at how we set this up to go ready to go with Docker, to build with Docker and to deploy those containers uh, to our build server for the following video where we'll look at building. So hopefully that was a, a decent enough top level. It did take a bit longer than I expected, but that's fine. And I hopefully see you in the next video. Questions or comments, as always, please um, chuck them in the comments below and I'll answer them if I can. Okay, I'll see you guys soon.